Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on Open Banking, How to Design for Financial Inclusion. We're very happy to have this opportunity to share with you CGAP's uh, work on open banking. My name is Natalie Greenberg, and I'm a member of CGAP's communication team, and I'll be moderating today's session. I hope if you've joined other events during Financial Inclusion Week that everything is, uh, everyone's having a good Financial Inclusion Week. So. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Ariadne Plotakis, a financial sector specialist who's been investigating the critical design component for an open banking regime that fosters financial inclusion. A CGAP paper by her and another CGAP colleague, Stefan Stashen, will be published later this month, and we will be sending you that publication once it's out. Today's webinar provides you with an early opportunity to learn about what they have found. So for today's session, we'll start with Ariadne giving a presentation, and that will be followed by Q&A. So just a couple of logistics before I hand it over. Uh, as, you've, as you've seen, your microphones uh, are muted during the, during the webinar. So we ask that if you have questions throughout that you use the chat box on the right side of your screen, we'll be collecting questions uh, throughout the presentation. Um, if you can, make sure that the comments and questions are um, sent to everyone so that we can all see. And when we're done with the presentation, we are recording it, and we will send you um, an email that has uh, the presentation along with a recording of today's webinar. So I'm now going to hand it over to Ariadne for today's presentation. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, I'm very excited to be here and to be able to um, give you a little bit of a teaser of the work that we've been doing for the last year. Stefan and I have done a landscaping, a landscaping survey of about 12 um, open banking regimes, and that's what I'm going to present today. But before I give you a little bit of a sneak peek, I'd like us to start um, with a poll. Uh, and I wanted to see what you thought open banking was. So we've got four options here. Um, it's either A, long opening hours of bank branches, B, open access for all to customer data held by banks, C, a data sharing framework for financial data between financial institutions and third parties, and D, a financial institution opening their APIs for third parties to connect. So I'm going to give you a couple of seconds. Um, I think we'll, what, what, about 20 seconds. See, uh, it'd be really great if you guys could respond because I'd, I'd like to know sort of the level of understanding um, of open banking before we start. Natalie, have we gotten some responses? Yes, Daniel will close the poll in about 10 seconds. Great. Great, so we think it's C, and I think that's probably a very good answer. Um, so that's great. That means that you know what I'm talking about, which will, I think, facilitate um, my explanation of the whole topic. So um, let's start, because even, um, even though I think you all have an idea of what we mean by open banking, CGAP, when we started our exercise, we needed to define what it was that we were looking at. And so, um, I'm going to present to you what we what we started off on with our definition. And I just want to be clear that when we say open banking, that's kind of not really precise. And, and we, we realized that in the, immediately when we started working on it because it's actually not fully open and it's not really about banking. So that's, it's interesting because that term has kind of stuck. Um, and we're using that both in the paper and in the webinar today because that's what a lot of the industry has been using. But as you'll see, I think we're going towards something more what we call open finance or open data. So here is what our definition is of open banking, and particularly what we call open banking regime, because this is, we're looking at this from a policy and a regulatory perspective. So this is how we defined it, and this is how we decided what, what um, countries and what regulatory frameworks we're looking at. First starts off that we believe it has to be a regulatory framework that is public sector driven or supported. Um, and it's a framework for data sharing. So that's really the main crux of the definition. There are things, for example, like payment initiation that you'll see in some of the frameworks. 
But we've decided, because about half of the ones that we looked at actually didn't have any payment initiation. We, we didn't include that. We really want to just focus on the data sharing element of it. Now, what are we sharing? What all of these regimes have in common is a sharing of customer transaction data. So this is pretty confidential information, although some of the regimes may share more data than that. And it's really a sharing between certain financial sector players, which we're going to call data holders in this presentation, with other financial sector stakeholders, which we call data users. And this sharing has to be upon customer consent. And usually, but not always, the data users are accredited in some form. So what does this definition mean for the scope of our work? It does mean that certain initiatives that have been called open banking do not fall under this definition. And I just want to be clear from the get-go. For example, purely private sector initiatives, for example, there's one in Nigeria currently, would fall out of the definition because it's not public sector driven or not participative driven yet. Um, also, another thing that I'd like to raise and, and why we did that poll in the beginning was to tease out whether there was any confusion with the idea of open APIs. Now, open APIs is actually more of a technology. It's a pri pri priority APIs that a financial sector provider makes available to other companies to consume, allowing those other companies to plug into its system. Now, that is a unilateral action of opening your APIs. And it's not the same thing as open banking, because for us, for open banking, for it to be a regime and a framework, you need to have several firms to agree to do the data sharing based on certain guidelines and criteria. And this may or may not include API standards. So just, I just wanted to be clear about that. And we see open banking really as a journey towards open finance and open data. Right, so I, I think this, uh, this shows, the, uh, let me give you a little bit of um, a definition of these, so you know what I'm talking about, but open banking, although, the, you know, the, which is probably the industry buzzword right now, if you look at the regimes that are really open banking, they really are focused very narrowly on payments and banking. And most of the initial open banking regulatory frameworks that we viewed, things as the UK and the PSC2 and the EU, are really more focused on payments and banking. When you go towards more sophisticated financial products, such as insurance, investments, and pensions, we're starting to talk about open finance. And in the future, it hasn't really happened, although a couple of the regimes we're looking at are aiming in this direction, is if you expand beyond financial sector data into data in other sectors, such as utilities, healthcare, social media, telecommunications, that's when you're going to get to open data. And you'll see on the bottom, I put these sort of icons for the open APIs to explain that open APIs could be part of any of these regimes, but it's not a requirement. And it's just sort of a technology that helps to facilitate the data sharing. So why is CGAP embarking on this research in open banking? We distilled two main reasons why open banking is an interesting proposition for regulators. The first one is about fostering competition. So there are two types of banking information that can help providers target their offers and evaluate risk. Something we call hard information, which includes a person's credit history and default history, and soft information, such as customer preferences and levels of income and behavior. Traditional banks have significant advantages regarding soft information, and this is one of the reasons that fintechs have had difficulties to compete with banks beyond initial successes. Even though banking has been liberalized in recent years, the reason we have not seen very positive outcomes for consumers yet is due to the, mainly to informational advantages of banks. Open banking is one remedy that addresses this informational asymmetry. And once you address this informational asymmetry, this can lead to things like entry of more players, increases in financial serving offerings in number and diversity, and lower prices. And not only does this attract new competitors, this also expands the market 
um, size for the banks as well. Reason two, probably more importantly, is that it empowers customers. The particularity of open banking is that it's real-time access to transaction data, which allows firms to offer services at exact point in time when a customer needs them. This reduces the background noise and offers something generally valuable. So in the data access basically allows both customers to have a consolidated view of their data, but in addition, it gives access to tailored products that may be more suitable to customers' needs and which are designed to engage customers more meaningfully. And this provision of information allows customers to make and act on better informed choices resulting in significant household savings. And we at Seekout, however, take this one step further and that we really believe that open banking, if properly designed, can also empower the poor. First, it can create savings, credit, and financial management products with improved value for those who are banked but underserved, which I will call the underbanked. And this is a comparison to the current products offered by existing institutions. Secondly, most of the regimes result in the entry of new types of open banking entities into the market. These are things such as account information service providers and payment initiation service providers. I'm gonna call these um, TPPs or third party providers. And they can increase competition of financial services leading to lower prices and an increased diversity of products which will render financial services more affordable to low-income populations. And further, these new open banking entities, because of their lower cost structures, may view previously unprofitable segments of the population, such as the unbanked and the underbanked, as profitable, which will result in the increase in the customer pie and will hopefully incentivize innovation by other stakeholders, such as the incumbents. So what we did in CGAP, in part of our review, is we looked at what are the needs of poor, and poor in particular in emerging markets. And we tried to see and try to map whether there were particular products that could help um, alleviate these pain points. I have here a summary of five main types of issues and types of products. But in our working paper, which will be published soon, there's a, a longer list, and this is more deeply um, set out. So first, one issue that's come up um, is obviously volatile and irregular income. Um, open banking enable products can help individuals save and create a financial cushion to smooth out income. And this includes products like saving trackers and automatic saving seekers. These are type of applications that calculate what a customer can save and when based on its financial history, but also on real-time data, and then automatically transfer those funds into a dedicated savings account. There's an example of a company called Moneybox in the UK that does that, and there's also one in, the, in South Africa called Meerkat. Another t issue that low-income persons have is they either have no access or inappropriate or access to inappropriate credit products. The types of um, open banking products we have seen, ha there are lots of different ones that deal with um, access, um, to credit, but some, for example, will provide access to credit through alternative data. For example, alternative data could include not just your general um, payment history, but also your rental payment history or your payment of mortgages. And there are examples of fintechs that do that, including Canopy in the United Kingdom and Rebel in Brazil. Another issue is lack of control over budget and funds. Um, and this type of lack of control can be countered with what we call personal finance management tools, or PFMs, which basically empower the customer with data insights on their transaction. And if you couple this with something called payment initiation, which is basically you're going to permit the, cost, the payment initiator to initiate transactions on behalf of the customer from the account of the account holder, this becomes an even more powerful tool as those, those dual functionalities allow customers to act on these insights in real time in a seamless and user-friendly way. 
Examples of that is Yotpay in the UK and Guia Bosolo in Brazil. And another issue that we've seen for poor people is the fact that they're often subject to something called the poverty premium, which means they pay high tariffs for household goods, higher than middle, middle or upper class individuals in the same country. And that these are in here tools such as utility switching applications, as well as personal finance management tools can really help. What these do is they actually go through the budget of the individual, they highlight where they're paying too much for a particular type of utility, and they actually facilitate to move that customer from that utility provider to the better um, priced utility provider in, in, in almost in a seamless fashion. So it actually it helps to both end the initial subscription, but allow it to then apply and, 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 and have access to the new type of tariff. Example of this, for example, is Trim in the U.S., and there's one called Plum in the U.K. Um, lastly, there's an issue of lack of identification to access financial services. And this is really a, an innovative way of using open banking data. Um, in the, and we see this in uh, Brazil. Brazil has brought this idea on board. It's that you could actually share um, the KYC and the customer registration data that a customer may have provided for one financial product at one point in time with these new TPPs or to other financial service providers. First, this is to reduce the paperwork and the timing and the delays that it may take in accessing. But if you, and in Brazil, it is really focused into sharing between financial services providers. But if you were to expand the remit and if you're going towards open finance or open data, and you, you can get access to data pools such as SIM card registration, then you could use that actually as an alternative mo um, method to um, CDC, or what we call the collaborative approach to CDC. So those, as I said, those were a couple of products that we've identified. You, you'll find more in our paper. Now, I just want to highlight one functionality. Even though it's not part of our definition of open banking, it's actually a key functionality in almost all of the products that I just mentioned. And I just wanted to um, give it, give more explanation about it. Um, as I said, it's payment initiation is, it allows a customer to authorize a third party to take money from his bank account on his or her behalf and transfer it directly to a merchant or a service provider's bank account and this cannot just be about between bank accounts. This can also be through e-money and mobile money, right? And so this is a way of circumventing the uses of credit cards. And this business model, which is introduced by some open banking regimes, such as the PSC2 in, in Europe, moves e-commerce and other digital payments to a push payment model. And this is in contrast with current pull models of the credit card systems, where the merchants call for payments via card scheme. Payment initiation is really interesting for the following reason. It gives customers greater control of their finances by allowing customers to perform payments from, from a wider variety of service providers. For example, when a customer receives a personalized mortgage offer from a third party who has collated their data, the customer can initiate the payment without leaving the mortgage site. And push payments are often considered faster and less risky for the payee, since the initiation and authorization is undertaken by the same entity, the payer. Further, the inclusion of payment initiation in open banking schemes is important in ensuring its successful adoption. Moving money in the financial sector is typically expenses, especially in markets that use card infrastructure. Adding payment initiation to data sharing can open up cheaper rails to move money. Beyond cost, payment initiation can democratize access to the payment system. A third-party provider may offer a highly useful application to customers because of the data provided through open banking, but it may not be able to provide basic payment features if it has to contract with the sponsor bank to enable payments. This barrier can be removed with inclusion of payment initiation in the open banking scheme. So I'm sure some of you are saying, this is all really interesting, but isn't open banking about smartphones? 
And we have looked into this. And we believe that not all, but most of open banking products can actually work on a feature phone. First, many open banking enable products actually only use the data on the back end. And therefore, you don't need any sort of visualization that a smartphone would provide. And examples of those products are the automatic saving sweeping that I mentioned, and something else called smart loan repayment. That's when you um, decide that you allow the repayment of a, of a loan not to be on a monthly basis for a predetermined set amount, but actually that can fluctuate. So both the timing of the repayment can fluctuate as well as the amount. And you could even decide to allow the customer to miss one or two months of payment and still not default on the loan. And that's something that can be done through open banking data. Then um, also another uh, type of, of product that can be done on the back end is the decentralized KYC or, the, or what I called the collaborative CCD before. And then there are other types of products that may be better on a smartphone, but are definitely doable on a feature phone. And that's through a series of SMS or a USSD menu. So it won't have full functionality, but you'll be able to bring some value. And the types of applications I would include is switching utilities and budgeting apps. So I would like to get, and before I get to the next part of the presentation, I want to get your feel of, of what, what we presented. Um, so I've got two more polls for you. The first question is, how important do you think open banking is in comparison to other regulatory priorities? Unfortunately, I'm very sorry, but the, the, um, the answers do not explain what they should be. So one is not at all, and four is very important. So um, I'm sorry about that. But um, one is not at all, and four is very, very important, and two and three are sort of somewhat and fairly. So I'll give you a couple of minutes. Actually, a couple of seconds. Natalie, let me know when you're closing the poll. Okay, we'll close the poll in about five seconds. Okay. That's interesting. So if I read this correctly, people think this isn't that important. That's hope that's interesting. I hope we'll be able to change that um that in, that that attitude or that opinion. Um but um it's probably true that there are other and, and this is actually an important point before I go on to the next section is that obviously there are lots of other regular priorities and what we're going to what I'm going to look at in the next section is really for regulators who've decided that they really they do want to implement open banking and that that's going to be their one of their priorities. So there's another poll, Natalie. Do you want to open the next poll? Yes, we will open that one. Second. Okay. So this is more about the, the link with financial inclusion. Do you think open banking can play an important role in supporting financial inclusion in your country? So one is not at all important, and four is extremely important. Oh, I'm very happy to see the results. I don't know, maybe it's the last result. Um, Every done it in reverse, as it wasn't a priority, but at least you, you, you do think that there is a good connection. I'm, I'm excited about that because I think the next part will be then very interesting to you. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an, a how-to. So what when we did our landscaping survey, we basically, we chose um, regimes that we, we had sufficient information about. So we, we didn't choose just 
um, there was one, the ones that had to be already put in place or there was sufficient information about, it had maybe not been launched yet, but it was sufficient information about how it worked. And looking across all these regimes, and part, many of them are in developed countries, but um, a lot of them were actually in developing countries. For example, we looked at Mexico, Brazil, India, Indonesia. And we found that there were some common areas, all these regimes had some sort of, there was some sort of issue that had to be dealt with. And so this is how we distill these into what we call our design component. We think there are 12 different issues a regulator needs to think about when they're going to implement open banking if they've decided they're going to go down this route. And four of these relate to scope, and they're on the, on the left-hand side, and eight of them relate to scope means really what it, what's going to be included and what's going to be excluded. And then eight of them relate to how are you going to implement the regime. Now, I don't have enough time to go through all of these in detail. I'd like you, if you're interested, um, tell you to go and check out our paper because these are all broken down, not only sort of what our observations were from the survey, but also what, what, what considerations emerging market regulators should think about in each of these, um, for each of these elements. But um, I will take you to, we felt that out of these 12, five of them, are actually particularly important to financial inclusion. Actually, I'm very sorry. I just realized I did not, did not move down the slide and I, I'm very, I apologies. So here we go, I'll do this again. Um, so if you see on the left side, there are the four elements, the design elements for scope. And on the right hand side, there are the eight elements for implementation. And I will look into now, the, I'm really just gonna look in today, the five that we feel are really important financial, for financial inclusion. So the choices that a regulator makes when they create a regulatory regime are not neutral. The choices are gonna determine what types of services can be provided and what types of business models are feasible. If a regulator in an emerging market wishes to ensure that open banking enabled products that alleviate frictions for low income population and their corresponding business models are possible, then these goals must be considered in the design of the open banking regime. Taking such considerations in mind in a regime's design is what we are gonna call financial inclusion by design. So of the 12 components, we feel that the four components that relate to scope and one that relates to implementation will determine to a large extent if the regime achieves financial inclusion by design. In specific, I will go into these points. So the first one is about types of services. What I mean here is what financial products services are included in the open banking regime. In general, we've seen two trends, a broad scope that covers many types of financial services, including credit, insurance, and maybe even investment, or a targeted scope that really focuses only on banking and or payments. And there can, it can be broader, right? So this is where I'm talking about um, open banking, and sort of open data, where you're gonna go beyond um, financial services sectors, such as energy and telecoms and utilities, although we actually haven't seen that happen yet. The second part that's an important element are the participants. And what I mean by this is the types of entities that participate in the regime. The entities that share data, so the data holders, and the entities that access the data, the data users. Generally, we've seen that the data users, which are often these TPPs, are different from the data holders. As often, the rationale of an open banking regime is to level the playing field by allowing parties that lack bargaining power, power, such as FinTechs and other TPPs, access to data that they would normally not be able to access. In certain countries, however, and I'll give example Mexico, Brazil, and India, you have at least um, certain extent, most participants are considered both data holders and data users. And thus, there's, we have something called data reciprocity between the participants. They can both request access to data from their fellow participants, but then they must also share their data with the other participants if requested. Then the third element is the types of data. We've seen that the majority of open banking regimes regulate access to three types, main types of data, 
One is generic service data, which is the publicly available information concerning specific financial services, such as the pricing of products, the localization of ATMs, agents, and bank branches. Then we have what we call customer data, which is the personally identifiable data of a customer that's required for account opening and administrative purposes. And this can include registration KYC data. And then thirdly is the customer transaction data, which is pretty much the heart of open banking. All the regimes include that type. And then fourthly, even though payment initiation is not part of a definition, it is a, a, uh, an element that we think is critical to financial inclusion. And I, I already explained this before, so I won't go in more depth. Then on the implementation side, one of the key elements is relates to cost distribution for the data request. What I mean by this is that when you implement an open banking regime, you actually have significant costs, both to put into place the sharing infrastructure, such as the APIs, and then any ongoing maintenance of these regimes, which are the communication costs for the individual requests and the sharing of data, we call like data requests. And both of these entail significant costs. Who bears these costs varies greatly across the regimes that we reviewed, if it is dealt with, and it has a, an effect on the affordability of the service to the customer. So now let me give you an idea of how these five elements affect a regime that if you wanted to design to support financial inclusion. The wider regime, ambit for services, and the more participants, the greater the number and the diversity of new services that can be enabled, and therefore the greater potential for competition. Similarly, the greater the breadth of eligible data types, the more likely that relevant products can be developed for low-income individuals. Customer transaction data, for example, would be key in all instances, and you would need to have access, you know, to require access to customer registration data if you wanted to enable collaborative CDD functionality. And to ensure that those who don't have any digital financial data trails can benefit, regulators should actually consider going beyond open banking and open finance towards open data. If an appropriate payment infrastructure is in place, Payment initiation should be enabled to ensure that customers that can act can act on the analytics and the recommendation that their data generates. And lastly, given that many there are many existing barriers to adopting financial services and the lack of resources of low income population, open, open banking regimes are likely to have the highest impact on these individuals if they're not required to pay for the service. So I wanted to show you a little bit how two different regimes have made different choices about exactly these elements. I've chosen both the UK and Brazil um, because the UK is probably the, the founding um, country or jurisdiction to have started open banking in the first place. And, it, and Brazil is probably part of the group of, I would call it open banking 2.0 countries, the ones that have come in a second wave and have learned a bit the lessons from the first wave of countries that have implemented open banking. And you can see that in some instances they've made similar choices, but in many instances they've made very different choices. Um, and here, so on to the left, I've plotted the five different design elements that we think are really important for financial inclusion and the, the choices that these regulators have made. Now, uh, now um, for types of services, the UK is open banking, I'm only talking about open banking. I'm not talking about PSD2 because, well, the UK is exiting um, on the 31st of December, and I don't know how that's going to continue to play out, but I assume that the open banking, the domestic initiative will continue. Um, it's really about banking. While if you look at Brazil, it's, all, it's about all services regulated by the central bank. So it's a significant wider scope. The participants are also different. Um, in the UK, the only mandatory participants are the nine largest banks. UK banks, and there is no data reciprocity in the scheme. While in Brazil, you've got mandatory segment one and two prudential conglomerates and all authorized payment institutions. And in, in addition, there is data reciprocity under the Brazil regime. The types of data are also different. For example, in the UK, it's only product data and transaction data, while Brazil adds also the customer registration data. 
both regimes do include payment initiation. So there I would say they're probably exactly alike. But again, also on the way the costs are distributed is different. So in the UK, we need to keep in mind that the background for open banking, it was a competition remedy imposed by the CMA on the banking industry because it was considered that the banking industry was opaque and anti-competitive. And so it was seen, it considered also as a policy choice that those, main, those banks that were considered anti-competitive would pay for the infrastructure that would allow for the data sharing. So, the, so the, in the UK, both the infrastructure and what we call the regulatory APIs, which are the ones linked to banking, are, all, are paid for by the nine largest banks. Although there does exist something called premium APIs, and that is, that is outside of the scope. And in Brazil, it's, it is different. You do also have this idea of tiered pricing for data calls. So there is a, in the regulation, there is a list of types of data calls that are free, and it, and it relates to use case, and also it's a number of calls per month per customer. So for example, one use case which is entirely free is access to the customer registration data. And then, they've ta and then they allow for the ability of some premium APIs but even that pricing has to be um, decided by a convention of all the industry participants. And that a convention is, going, is overseen by the Central Bank of Brazil. So it's not a free mar completely free market price either. And the difference also is how the infrastructure is paid for. And it's actually paid for by all the participants, um, but proportionate to their market share. And so, to finish up the, part, the, the presentation, before I get to the questions, I wanted to take you through how all of these elements sort of combine. And what I mean by that is we've identified pain points of the poor, we've identified open banking products that might help them, and then we've identified design components that regulators needed to consider. So here I want to, and this you'll find a lot more in our paper, but basically we've taken the products and we've basically mapped out what that effect is on the design of the regime. So if you want to push a certain type of product and for that product to be aimed at low income individuals, then you need to take certain choices in regards to those particular five design elements. And here, the, the, the product that I've decided to highlight today is about savings. I think savings is really important for low income people, probably more than credit. And the type of product that I mentioned earlier is the, is, is the one I'm going to look at, which is the saving trackers or the automatic sweepers. So just, uh, just to recap what those products are, saving, um, automatic saving sweepers are, are the applications that calculate what a customer can save and when based on their financial history, and then they automatically transfer funds to dedicated savings accounts, right? And then there's something called saving trackers which are a little bit different, and which is, is that they actually look at a customer's um, transaction history. They identify areas where the customer is paying too much, for example, for a type of utility. It, they help switch the customer from a high paying utility to a lower paying utility. And then they repurpose the additional money that the customer had paid for the high purpose utility and move that towards savings. So ultimately, the customer is not actually at all out of pocket, it's actually paying exactly the same amount of outgoings it has every month, but it's actually creating savings because it's got a cheaper utility or other type of expense. And uh, so those, and those two, I put the logo, logo of two of the, um, country, the companies that do that type of work, Meerkat and Digit, but there are other ones out there. So if you're going to try to enable this, what do you need to do? Well, you look first at the participants. You need to make sure that the participant, the, that the banks are in there, but also you're going to want the money, the e-money issuers, and any, basically the PSPs, any entity that's going to have access to the payment history of a customer. And that brings us to the types of data. What's really crucial for this product is you need to include customer transaction data. Now, this product doesn't require a very big scope for the open banking regime. It's really about banking and payments, but if we for the other products that you will see in our paper, you'll see that you sometimes will need an expanded scope. But what's really key here is about payment initiation. For this to work, you must have payment initiation. And also, you need the ability to do something called recurring payment initiation. What that means is if 
you're, this is not about having the customer pay once. If he's going to be pulling money out of his um, current account and putting in his savings account on some sort of periodic basis, whether it's monthly or weekly or whenever there's sufficient funds, that requires the ability for the TPP to do that on a recurring basis. So that actually has to be something that has to be baked into the regulatory regime. And another issue that's, in, that's important to consider is the cost because this type of product requires real-time continuous data. Why? Because basically the TPP needs to know not only the financial history, but it really needs real-time data about the customer, maybe on an even hourly or even less hourly basis to determine when to sweep that money. And so that, so if you have a regime where there's tiered pricing or there's um, a certain amount free and a certain non-free, this could clearly get expensive. So that needs to be keep, kept into the design. Now, um, as I said, we've looked at the, uh, the other products that I've mentioned are in our papers. I hope that you'll be interested enough to go have a look. And I'm now happy to take, you, to take some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Ariadne. And thank you to all of you. It's been a very active chat um, during the discussion. And I just want to reiterate a couple points. Um, this webinar was recorded and we will send it out to all of you. Um, the paper that Ariadne um, has mentioned a few times is um, upcoming. We're publishing it shortly. So we will also be sending that paper to you um, once it's out. So today was a nice sneak preview of everything that you'll find um, in the paper. Now we have 20 minutes left for the Q&A, and so I don't think we'll be able to get to everyone's questions, but we have um, taken note of all of them, so can follow up um, as needed. So, Ariadne, I've, I've added those um, questions to you. So I will start by asking you one, um, mm -hmm. and uh, we will go from there. So this question is um, from Attila, and it asks, are open banking regimes doomed to fail as long as the liability question between banks and third-party providers relating to data security is not solved? Wondering if you have any insights or views on that. Okay. So put Absolutely. that in the in the WebEx chat so everyone can see that question. Yeah. So I didn't go into it today because it wasn't one of our um, financial inclusion design elements but it is a critical design element. And in our paper, we argue that you have to deal with these issues as part of the regime. Um, now, when we went and did the survey, we saw that there are some, there are, I would say the first, no, it's actually not true. There, it's really um, haphazard. Some regimes look at it, and for example, PSC2 does look at liability, and, um, the, and, and also the UK regime has, for example, um, dispute resolution mechanisms in it, but not all the regimes have it. What we do actually agree, I actually agree with you, you need to have those in there because if it's not and it becomes too difficult to figure out with liability, first of all, if the customer is left out of pocket, that will create an issue, right? And that will make maybe less interest and less trust in the product. And then even if the customer is made whole, for example, in PSG2, that's the position, the customer has to be made whole, and they get made, they're made whole by the account, their account provider, so their bank. And then the rest, and then after that happens, the rest of the entities need to figure out who's liable, right? Even if that, if there's no rules to explain that, then that becomes problematic. So I completely agree, and this is, I'm sorry I wasn't able to go into that, but yes, um, it is a critical element. I'm not saying it's doomed to fail, but it will make create a lot more problems in adoption, and we may also disincentivize. You know, it may create some interesting incentives between the account holders and the TPPs. I hope I answered that question. Great, thank you. I'm going to move on to the next question that I've just um, put in the chat as well, and it's course related to COVID. So what role, if any, has COVID played in overcoming challenges or incentivizing regulators to implement open banking? Um, have there been any meaningful reactions in the past few months that you've seen? So, I mean, the, where I've seen really interesting data is in the UK. I mean, the UK is one of the first regimes, and obviously it's not a developing country, it's a developed country, but they basically saw, I think, over a 100% increase in open banking applications usage in, since COVID has hit. So it ha in, in the UK, it's been huge, but I've actually also seen reports that it's had an effect 
also in other countries as well. Um, not necessarily that there's been a re it pushes regimes to happen, but the products that are out there, and there also are products that are open banking enabled, but there's no regime, and those are also taking having great uptake. So I think COVID is going to be a strong um, catalyst. And I hope it's a catalyst for regulators. I mean, regulators, it takes a lot longer than just, you know, a couple of minutes to download an app to, to get them to focus their regulatory agenda and then also to actually, you know, implement it. But I think we're going to see the fruits of that soon. Yeah, Natalie, the so next question, please. Yep, yeah, sure. So I'm going to paste this in. And this is around... Um, a credit scoring system. So David asked if there's been much effort in creating a shared credit scoring system between financial institutions for unbanked or other non-traditional clients. Um, and, and I guess the second part to that is what are the obstacles uh, to setting up shared credit histories across banks um, and MFIs? So I haven't come across yet a, sh a share. What, what sounds to me is you're sort of using open banking for to, to act like as a, as a credit bureau, right? Um, I haven't actually seen that happen. I have seen app, I have seen lots of applications that are doing credit that are doing it, but the proprietary. So, for example, in Brazil, there is a two two fintechs that do it, Guia Bolsonaro and Rebel, and they both do some type of alternative credit scoring. And I even think that they're able to share that, but I'm not sure how much the other FSPs use that. But that's actually a really interesting question. And um, just to explain, CGAP, this is our first step in our work in open banking. And we are doing further work in this. And one of the areas we are going to look at is what is the implication of open banking um, types of data sharing in, in, with credit bureaus? And how could that technology and those frameworks change that exchange? So this is an area I think we're going to see some change, and it'll be really interesting. Thank you. Um, next, I've posted a question um, from from Catherine. So, uh, with regards to holders or users of data, would there not be an asymmetry of costs and benefits? How does this affect behavior of or of players? Excuse me. Sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. And I've posted it in the chat. With um, whether with regard to holders of users of data, how would there not be an asymmetry of costs and benefits. How does this affect behavior of players? The holders, okay, so, um, well, it really depends on whether, who is, if, how the costs are um, distributed. So what could happen is it could be free for the data users to have it. And that could be, that, for example, that is the regular choice in the UK for certain types of API. So it's free, so the, the, the user, does not pay, right? In other cases, the data holder is allowed to, and therefore that means that the data holder is going to pay because they're not being reversed for whatever work they're doing. So ultimately that pushes on there. You can have another, it be redistributed where the data holder is allowed to charge the data user, right? And that could be, for example, we've seen that um, in the tiered pricing in Brazil, but also in Mexico, for example, that, that is the case. Then the question is, so will the data user then pass on the cost to the consumer? And that's not completely clear because a lot of what open banking APIs do is that it really brings, it's a way of reducing a lot of the input costs of the financial service provider. So it may be the case that there's enough reduction of input, of, of input costs that it can absorb the price from the data that they have to pay to the data holder. So it's a, it, it is complicated, and I don't know. There's a second. There's a second part of that question, right, Natalie? I'll just see where I can find it. Um, yes. So the the second part was um, how does this affect behavior of players? Yeah. So it, it it definitely affects the players, and that's why we think this is a really critical point that regulators need to think through. So they when they decide what they're going to what if if they they may decide to let the market you know, decide to decide for it. And but that in of itself has implications. So they need to there's a lot of um it's a lot of it's on I mean there is a uncertainty in that you don't know how the FSPs are going to react, the ones that are going to provide the I mean the TPPs, right? Um you can, however, in regulation if you wanted to, you could, for example, 
prohibit that the cost is passed on the consumer. You could do that. But then that would have implications as well. So, yes, it, this is an issue, and this is why we think that that is a very important, critical design element that regulators really need to think about all the implications before they go for a particular model. Thank you. Um, I'm going to post right now a question um, that we got from, from Abby, and it says, in a R2A uh, paper published last spring about the data stack, uh, they identified several limitations of open data frameworks to increase competition and give customers access to more information. They pointed at open data commons as a more desirable solution. Example, better incentives for the private sector to share data. Um, what's your take on the pros and cons of open data portals versus open data commons? Okay. I'm Sorry, but I um, this isn't quite exactly the same area as I'm looking at. So I think if I understand correctly, because I haven't read that paper, um, that th this is the open data for uh, for everyone to access, possibly on maybe I'm not sure if it's um, just public data. Whether the, I'm I'm not really sure where this. Unfortunately, I'm not really sure exactly what the difference is. But when I'm talking about open banking, it, it's definitely, it's not open. That's what I'm saying. It's very proprietary and that it's really just the sharing of specific data that a customer agrees to a financial service provider that it wants to share the data with. And it's not like an open platform, right? And so even when I'm talking about open data, I'm not talking about an open platform that you can access just general data. I'm talking about it's open in that it's opening the sectors of the economy. So we're going beyond financial services and we're getting access to a person's utility data or their data in regards to telecommunication. But still, again, it stays within the confines of that relationship between that customer and that FSP, right? And so I'm not really sure if this is comparable. And I'm sorry if I haven't gotten that answer completely right, um, but I think I'm going to have a look at that paper. And I'm happy to, to respond once I've had a bit more background. No problem. Thank you. Um, the next question that I'm posting is, is um, from James, and he asks, what efforts are the regulators putting in to ensure sound and fair rates in open banking? So if you mean by rates, the, you mean the cost for the data calls? then what it really it varies so either there is none so they let the market determine it or there is some sort of oversight by the central bank and um for example that's the case in brazil so they're actually asking the all the participants to get around and to agree first what the pricing is going to look like and then there's going but that is their subject basically to the oversight of the central bank so if the central bank feels it's excessive then it can actually ask the participants to reconsider the pricing. So I think the way the the way the, the regulators can do that is really in the way they um, approach the the cost part of the of the regime. And so it can either be in the regulation or which I'm not a huge fan of because you may want to be able to change this, or it can be way in in the rules that you set up of how the industry players. Um, agree to, uh, to, to, to the pricing. And for example, that's the, what's happened in Brazil. And as long as the central bank or the financial sector has some oversight, then they're able to a certain extent to ensure that there's an equitable outcome. Thank you. Uh, we have time for, for a couple more questions. Um, so the next one is, um, as a broader point, should open banking finance be led by regulators or by the market participants? That's a really good question. So we've seen in our survey both models, and I didn't speak a lot about it today, but in Asia, a lot of the open banking initiatives we see there are actually um, private initiatives that were, that were the private, private initiatives that then the regulator came in and decided to support. And so, therefore, that's why you see a lot more, I didn't talk, discuss this either, but there's, there can be both mo mandatory and voluntary versions of open banking. And mandatory is when the regulator comes in and say, okay, these are, the, these are the rules of the game. If you want to play 
or you have to play and this is what, what they are, versus in a voluntary regime, you have um, you don't have to participate if you don't want to, but if you do, then you agree to a certain set of rules that are set out in that framework. And I, I mean, we, I think it's a little bit early on in the journey to see whether which approach is going to have more fruit for it. I mean, there is, I mean, it makes sense that there would be some reticence um, for incumbents to join certain these open banking frameworks unless they really believe that there is some competition or some innovation element or that, you know, and, and I think that's part of what we see in Asia is that it's really, they see it's coming and they know that this is going to be important and that people are doing open APIs anyway. So they might as well just jump, jump on the bag wagon versus I feel that in, um, in, in other jurisdiction, it's more of a, unless I'm forced, it's not going to happen. I think partially um, it's the market dynamics, partially it's probably also cultural. Um, and so I, I think the, the, it's a little bit early. The jury is out on which approach is, go, is going to win, but there's definitely both. And it's not just the regulator necessarily dictating how it's going to play out. Thank you. And I think this will likely be the last question. Um, as we roll out open banking with its attendant competition, coupled with customer empower empowerment, will breed customer disloyalty, which will negatively impact on bank stability. So the question is, what should be done to preserve the stability of the banking sector as it becomes more competitive with an empowered customer? That's an interesting question. I haven't really thought about that. I'm going to... You mean, I think what you mean there is you mean customer disloyalty with their first, I guess, their initial, um, you know, bank or initial payments provider. And that means that they're going to be changing more. I'm not convinced that there is that necessarily relationship with bank, with bank instability. I think if banks are able to adapt and if they you know, if they, as, especially if they're going to be part of the open banking regime and they're not just data holders, they don't just give data, but they also request data and they start offering similar open banking services, I think that banks aren't necessarily going to lose all of their customers. I think they may even gain some different ones. So I'm not convinced with that link. Um, and I think I, I personally have the view that competition is good in, in the banking. I think it needs a little bit of instability so that we can bring some, some of the margins down and bring out more innovative and more um, sort of diverse products. Um, so I, 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 don't, I, I don't see that link, but I'm happy to discuss that um, offline as well. Great. Thank you, Ariadne. I know that was a, a lot of different questions that, that were thrown at you and being um, the only presenter, it's, it's, uh, you, you went from, from point to point. So thank you um, for that. And I want to give everyone here a big thank you for your participation during today's webinar. Uh, as I said, it was a very active chat. We're, we're excited to see the interest in this topic. Uh, to re to reiterate once again, uh, we will send out a link to this paper once it's published, um, and we will be sending out a link to today's presentation as well. Um, and finally, I want to give a big thank you to, to you, Ariadne, for, um, for your presentation today, and thanks again for all of you for joining. Uh, enjoy the rest of Financial Inclusion Week, and thanks again. Thank you very much.